we are going to deal with uh, an important uh, topic discussed in the devotion classic of Bhagavata. <coughs> Bhagavata is a devotion classic uh, written around 8th century AD. Its original, some of its original forms existed even in 2nd century BC, but this book this work took its present form around 8th or 9th century AD. That is the view of historians <coughs> and um, scholars. Now, the topic is a spiritual dialogue uh, from the Bhagavata Purana. There are many spiritual dialogues in Bhagavata Purana. Um, this particular uh, dialogue uh, is between a great king, a great emperor, his name was Nimi, and nine great sages who, you, who, who visited him once. Now, I shall give you some background. In ancient times, uh, sometimes emperors and kings and princes used to renounce their kingdom and go into forests in search of spiritual teachers and discuss with them philosophical, spiritual, metaphysical topics. Sometimes great men of wisdom, saints and sages and philosophers used to visit the kings and emperors in their palaces and discuss spiritual, philosophical topics. In this particular episode, the conversation is between nine sages who visit who visit this king, this emperor, namely King Nimi, in his palace, and when they when they arrived, the king uh, received them with great reverence and respect, and then uh, he puts nine questions, important questions related to spiritual and metaphysical topics, and these nine sages give their answers. In the verse, you will find one verse in that chapter, I can refer to this, you can the, see. <coughs> you find 21st verse if you take that verse, the second chapter, 11th Skantha, 11th Skantha is a it's a book, you may section of a work, it's called Skantha. In Bhagavata, there are total 12 Skanthas, 12 sections. Each section will have several chapters. And each chapter, each chapter will consist of several verses. So, this particular episode is discussed in the 11th Skantha, 11th book. In the second chapter, this one verse, twenty-first verse. <coughs> so there you find Kavir Hari Antariksha Prabuddha Pippalayanaha Avi Hotroda Drumelas Chamasa Karabhajanaha. These are the nine sages. Their names are given here. Kavi is one. Kavi is the name of one sage. Hari another one. Then Antariksha, the third sage. Fourth one is Prabuddha. Fifth one, Pippalayana. The sixth, Avirhotraha. The seventh is Drumilaha. The eighth, Chamasaha. And the ninth, Karabhajanaha. These three, sorry, these nine great sages are visiting the great king, Nimi. He was the king of the kingdom uh, of Janaka, roughly speaking in today's Bihar state of India. The place, not the place, not far from the, from the, from the holy spot where Buddha got this illumination. The same state, Buddha Gaya and all. Now, <coughs> when they arrived, uh, it is now you can I, I shall refer to some of the verses when we go into detailed discussion at that time we'll discuss now <coughs> you
You see one, what, 28 verse. This is very important. Though it is not directly related to the episode. In this 28 verse. Say manye bhagavata sakshat parshadan vo madudvishaha. Vishnu bhutani lokanam pavanaya charantihi. So very, this verse is very important. But it gives you a glimpse into the spiritual culture of those days. Now, <clears throat> the king tells these sages, I look upon you as the embodiment of divinity itself. I look upon you, addressing the sages, the king says, I look upon you as the walking embodiments of divinity itself. Great saints and sages like you wander about the world you are roaming about the world to help people like me, to find out people like me who are sincere seekers, to give a helping hand to us. So, in those days, great saints and sages used to travel all over India. And whenever and wherever somebody is turning to spirituality, turning to spiritual quest, they would go there and give them instruction. This was the common practice. So the king tells them, uh, I consider myself to be uh, blessed uh, in having got this opportunity to see you because people like you, the next verse he says, people like you, people like you are walking about they are roaming about this countryside uh, with, uh, with the noble intention of giving a helping hand to spiritual seekers like me. <clears throat> that's the that's significant because it gives a glimpse into the culture, the spiritual tradition of those days. That's, it's, it's very, it is important to bear, keep this in mind, to appreciate and enjoy this episode. Now, <clears throat> in the thirtieth verse, the king asked the question. The question is this. I shall first explain in English what the question is. Please teach me what is good for humanity. That's the idea behind. Please teach me uh, what, will, what will be auspicious, useful, helpful, to me in my spiritual journey. At atyantikam kshemam, say one word is used, you know, atyantikam kshemam means ultimate good, ultimate auspiciousness. Anything which is, which gives you peace and tranquility, not temporarily, for eternity. Now, any uh, material or empirical gain also gives you a degree of happiness or satisfaction. But that is not eternal. Because what you what gives you satisfaction vanishes one day. So before you got it, we were dissatisfied. And when we get it, we are anxious not to lose it. So at that time also we are not actually enjoying <laughs> and then when we lose it, then of course it is lost. So Bhagavata in another context says, any material gain is misery before you get it, and misery when you have got it, and misery of course when you have lost it. So this verse uh, uses one word, you know, the meaning is Atendiyam Kshema, means ultimate, ultimate good. Some, you gain something which will never be lost, which will be eternal, which will not just make you satisfied, which make you contented. This contentment is much higher than satisfaction. Satisfaction is the feeling, well, I am fine, you get something, but then it will be lost. Now, contentment is a feeling that you get, well, I have got something, there is nothing beyond this that I can look for. Mm -hmm. 
that I can, that I should uh, seek. That feeling is called, is used, is meant by a particular phrase here, Atyantikam Kshemam. Atyantikam means ultimate, eternal, something that gives you an eter- a sense of eternal peace and tranquility, a feeling that I have got something, there is nothing beyond this that I must search for. That is called, in fact, that is what everyone is looking for. People are knocking at the wrong doors, that's all. They are knocking at the wrong... When, they, when people um, uh, try to uh, uh, acquire this ultimate eternal contentment through money, they, they think that money will, ga- will give them eternal peace. Because that, this is the, uh, the, the subject of et- the eternal quest of humanity this ultimate good. But they do not realize that what they are trying to get will not give them ultimate or eternal contentment. It will only give them temporary satisfaction. That they do not realize or they realize only too late. So here the king tells the sages, I want to ask you about something which will make me contented. contented for all life. Because, then he says, samsara is being shanardhopi, satsanga shevadhir niranam. Meaning is this, in this world, samsara actually, you know, it has got a much deeper meaning. Samsara actually implies this eternal wheel of, this rotating wheel of birth, death and rebirth. That's the meaning of samsara. Samsara actually means a kind of, it implies a, a flow, Continuous flow, continuous flow of life activities for fulfilling different desires, death and rebirth and continuing this rotation of wheel, wheel of existence. That is samsara. Now in this samsara, even for one second, for, for, a, for, a, for a few minutes, if we can get holy company to discuss spiritual ideas, it is, it is a great benefit. It is a great treasure. Actually, when the word is used as shevati, he means treasure. The Sanskrit term has got some. You know, the Sanskrit language as in classical Hebrew, Latin and all that. They've got certain uh, deep-rooted uh, implications. So here samsara doesn't mean this world. Though the superficial meaning could mean this world. But actually samsara means this uh, endless uh, game of being born, enjoying and suffering, dying and again being reborn. And also it implies the idea that what we have got right now is a state of imperfection. There is a higher state that we are trying to achieve, that we are seeking. And we have already had this in the past. But then due to some uh, uh, undesirable karmas, we got the present state. We had to get back. We had to uh, regain our lost spiritual kingdom, in other words. That is the implication of samsara. Because a wheel is wheel. To get out of this wheel is the supreme goal of human existence. For that, the easiest path is to meet somebody and to discuss with them and to get from them some positive spiritual ideas that will help us to turn a new leaf in our life, to, mm-hmm. new, to, chap, to open a new chapter in our life. All these implications are to be understood here, samsara. So, sevadhi means treasure. What is a treasure? The treasure is getting out of this wheel of this eternal uh, samsara, empirical existence, which is full of empirical enjoyments and empirical miseries, both temporary. So, and for this, he asked a question, please teach me uh, that that spiritual wisdom 
which will uh, help me to get out of this samsara this is the first question which he puts and in answer to this question the sage says that we can find in the 36th verse of second chapter a very famous verse this is uh, this verse is chanted by uh, countless devotees millions of devotees every day in the morning a very very famous verse it actually means this by word by deed by thought by all our actions actions with mind actions with vocal cords or uh, any kind of every minute of our existence and every act should be turned into an offering to god this is the implication here that's the essence of here so the sage says the first question is answered by the first sage kavi because in the list of nine sages the first one is kavi the kavir hari antariksha prabuddha pippalayanaka so the first sage is kavi so he says the easiest path is this whatever you do with body with mind with word with senses with intellect and also our time and energy because we live and we live we function we work in this canvas of time and energy all days should be an offering to god look upon our entire existence all our activities as an offering to god this is the best and easiest way to get out of this wheel of empirical existence the verse is famous kayena kayena actually means by body vacha means by word manasa means by in by mind indriya means by different senses of action and senses of perception but, and then buddhi actually means intellect then our own action and then anusuddha swabhava anusuddha swabhava actually means our natural impulses see the verse is very very profound what we do with our body now is perhaps a conscious act what we speak also and what we think to a lesser extent a conscious action what we feel so body mind intellect word etc but there is another important point anusuddha swabhava anusuddha actually means you know again it refers to pravaha means means flow see whatever we have accumulated whatever accumulated tendencies impressions and characteristics that we have accumulated in our mind these tendencies and impressions constitute what is called our innate nature we it called swabhav there are certain things that we can't do in a, we cannot help doing in in a, in a given manner see there are certain characteristics and certain behavior patterns which we can't help uh, following you know certain inherited inherent characteristics of doing certain things or not doing certain things it may be thinking it may be speaking it may be acting there are certain things that we can't help doing in a particular way see swami vivekananda in his karma yoga lectures he he refers to this idea so he says we are good because we can't help it we are bad because we can't help it <laughs> it doesn't mean that we are we are helpless in the almighty hands of destiny or fate no no the point is this we have inherited certain innate inherent characteristics and they push they drive us in a particular way we have no choice in the matter this this 
impulses and characteristics are implied by this word anu sruta subhava in sanskrit it's a technical term so here the first sage says whatever we do conscious action or unconscious action conscious action like physical activities speaking and unconscious action though it may not be in our hands but still if we mentally offer all this to god then whatever we do gets sublimated so a work which is done as a work becomes a worship if the attitude behind the work is changed <clears throat> make it an offering to god then in the most empirical work becomes worship it could be the other way sometimes you know a worshipper will do his worship as work that is the other end of it so work can become a worship if our attitude changes and then worship also can become a work if our attitude is negative so here what the great sage says says is this whatever we do with body with uh, word with mind means thoughts so kayena vacha manasendriyeva so kayena means through by body vacha means by word what we speak manasa means what thought flashes in our mind we are no control over that and then indriya actually means senses perses senses of perception senses of action and intellect and also by inherent tendencies built in characteristics whatever we do we we pray to god to accept this as an offering then what happens whole human life becomes a sacrifice whole human our whole human existence becomes a worship becomes a spiritual practice this is and this is possible even for those who do not believe in god because the best way to convert action into karma yoga is by adding action with non attachment to remove if you remove attachment from our action then action becomes a worship this is possible for all you need not even believe in in a particular god of course for those who believe in god with this becomes natural easy very easy but even if you don't believe in god if you remove the selfish desire selfish motives from our actions then these actions become an offering to god the swami vivekananda says you know he once says the the the, the the best offering to god is the service done to the uh, man living next door to you it is a, in the in the practical vedanta swami vivekananda says all these ideas are taken from out a great text of ancient times so this is the first question first answer what should we do to live in this world uh, and practice spirituality living in this world not going away from this world it is possible for people belonging to all walks of life you need not go into forests though the sage mentioned earlier that holy company is the easiest way to practice to imbibe spiritual values that was a instruction given earlier but then while elaborating this subject the great sage says this is this is one way to practice this in daily life whatever we do with body bodily actions whatever words we speak and whatever thoughts we think and whatever ideas we cognize with the intellect and whatever may be our actions over which we have no control because there are certain inherited inherent uh, characteristics which are not within our control only after doing that we feel who oh, have done this but if we always keep in mind that whatever i do is an offering to god 
then all these actions become an offering. Not only that, a, per, a person who has sincerely surrendered his actions and the results of his actions to God cannot do anything evil. It becomes physically and psychologically impossible for such a spiritual seeker to do anything evil. So this, and this is the first question, this is the first answer. Now I will go to the next question because we have nine questions and nine answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, from 11 to 11.30, we'll have interaction. If there is any point to be discussed further, we'll discuss at that time. <coughs> and even if you feel that certain ideas are not at all clear to you at the time of the class, then you can raise, I shall repeat the idea again. Now the next question. <coughs> The king uh, continues his dialogue. Of course, you know, the first sage, after answering the first question, he elaborates his subjects. There is a long, elaborate discussion based on the, uh, the first answer. But we, we, don't, we, can't, we don't have time to go through all those uh, details. Now, the next question. <coughs> You can come to second chapter, forty-fourth verse. There you find the king ask the second question. <clears throat> this is a very important question from a philosophical and spiritual point of view. Because there are three important verses which are which, which are very important, which are very crucial in understanding the second answer. Now here, in the 44th verse, the king asks the question, Atha Bhagavatam Bruta Yad Dharmo Yadrisho Nranam Yadha Acharidhi Yad Brudi Yair Linkehi Bhagavat Priyaka Now he asks the question, Now you told me that the best way to practice spirituality in this world is to make an offering of all our activities. Bodily activities, actions, then verbal activities, words that we speak, mental activities, thoughts and impulses, and even inherent characteristics. This was the answer that you give. Now, I would like to know the characteristics of a devotee, of an ideal spiritual seeker who has attained this level of spiritual evolution. That is the question. Please explain to me the characteristics, the behavior patterns and the attitudes of an ideal devotee, of a really enlightened spiritual seeker who has surrendered his whole existence to God, who has spiritualized his whole life. What are his characteristics and how do we distinguish them when we see in a crowd, because in a crowd we cannot understand, but what are the distinguishing marks and characteristics of such a great spiritual seeker. This is the second question. You find the 44th verse. Now in answer to this question, um, the second sage is Hari is the second sage. He gives uh, a picture of three levels of spiritual evolution. He uh, gives the picture of a devotee of the highest spiritual development, a highly evolved spiritual devotee. And then those there are those who have not so well evolved. And then there are those who belong to a lower level. Now, if you read this verse, you will understand uh, there, there are two levels of evolution. 
evolution taking place at the level of the seeker and evolution taking place at the level of the sort. See, a highly evolved spiritual seeker will have a sublime concept of ultimate reality. He would think of God as an all-pervading reality or encompassing reality who is, who is present everywhere, who is omnipresent, all-pervading, who is immanent and who is transcendental. But a primitive spiritual seeker will think, well, my God sitting in my temple is the right God. All others are all demigods or maybe not even gods at all. Now, between these two, there are those who belong to the intermediate level. So, two types of evolutions are hinted at here. The first verse is, 45th verse when, Sarva Bhudeshuya Pasyet Bhagavad Bhava Matmanaha Bhudani Bhagavadi Atmani Esha Bhagavad Otamaha. See, 45th verse. Here, you can get the picture of a highly evolved spiritual seeker. What we call a liberated person or a novel of Brahman or a mystic. You can use that. Those spiritual seekers who have gone beyond the formalities of conventional religious practices. Those who can see God not only in a temple or a church, but those who feel the presence of God, not just feel, who experience the presence of God in everything in this world. That is the picture of the highest spiritual seeker. He is not a seeker, he has already reached his goal. That picture is clearly drawn in the 45th verse. Sarva Bhude Suya Pasyet. He sees the same divine reality in all living beings. See, Buddha actually means anything which has come into existence. Not only human beings or members of the animal kingdom even trees and plants, because he can't see anything other than God in this world. So God is not just a creator God for him. God is a divine principle, which is all-pervading, which is immanent in every being and omnipresent. So, see, Yeha means the one, the one who sees, who experiences, the presence of the Lord in all beings. You should always remember, when we use the word God, please remember, in this text, we do not mean a God who creates his world and stays away from his creation. This is a very important principle for us to understand. Here, of course, we use the word God because this is a theistic concept, you remember. This is there is the highest Advaitic or non-dualistic experience hindered at it. But the great sage Hari is here expounding the characteristics of, uh, of the highest devotee of God, one who is dearest to God and one to whom God is the dear, uh, dearest. So that God is not a creator God who stays away from his creation. Rather, it is the divine principle that is present as the immanent principle in all living beings and also as the omnipresent, all-pervading reality present everywhere and also the ultimate transcendental reality. So, he says, the 45th verse says, the one who sees the presence of the Lord in all beings as non-different, non-distinct from himself and who feels the presence of all beings in God. So you see, he sees God in all beings and he sees all beings in God. 
he feels the presence he experiences he sees the presence of the lord in the entire creation at the same time he sees creation the whole creation in god so this person is the word used here is bhagavata uttamaha uttamaha means the highest he is the highest devotee there are three levels in you know. uttama means the highest madhyama means middle level athama means lowest so who is the highest devotee in other words the highest devotee is also the highest philosopher because at the experience level philosophy and devotion merge into one which is technically called mystical experience that's the word used in the western mystical tradition but that's Im- that implies practically the same thing so there is one point when the highest non dualistic philosophy of jnanam or wisdom merges with the highest devotional experience so the hari says my dearest devotee or the devotee who Uh, has reached the highest level of devotional evolution is the one who sees god everywhere and who sees nothing but god there is nothing else to be seen for him because there is nothing in this world which is distinct from god not that he may see the mic or this glass or the, the clock as god not in that way there is nothing else in this world other than god as the ultimate reality see if you say well this glass has nothing to do with god you have to admit god is one reality and this glass is another reality so both are realities in that case the glass has got the same status of reality with god so god is not absolute reality so that's the idea behind so in the idea is this the whole creation as its origin at god's will in that sense it is non distinct non different from god now even here there are two levels of evolution as you experience the divine principle within you you become contented you become enthroned you become wise but it has got another dimension as you go deeper and deeper into yourself you also farther and farther towards the external world because you also see You, you 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 are you are able to see that the same immanent principle that is residing within you is the all pervading reality in the external world so what is immanent is also omnipresent so there is a unity of experience as we go deeper and deeper inward we also go farther and farther outward in the sense as we realize the immanent principle within we also realize the omnipresent reality without then you can't see anybody from anybody as distinct from you you can't hate anyone you may live in the world but you won't have any kind of distinction any kind of ill feeling towards to us anyone so this is also this highest sublime attitude is and is a is a natural characteristic of a devotee if you read the gita third chapter you can find all this the highest devotee is one who while realizing the presence of the lord within also realizes the presence of the lord as the all pervading omnipresent reality everywhere so he becomes a great human being and also it becomes a great seeker within those who are interested if you read bhagavad gita 8th verse 12th chapter 8th verse in bhagavad gita if you go to 12th chapter bhakti yoga 8th verse you uh, you find the same idea there you find mayeva mana adhatsva mai buddhim niveshaya nivasi shashi mayeva ada udham na samshaya the meaning is this the highest devotee is one who lives in me 
and in whom I live. That's the meaning here. The highest devotee who has dedicated his mind and intellect to me lives in me and I also take my residence in his heart. That's the literal meaning of the eighth verse in the twelfth chapter you find. <coughs> so first the sage gave a graphic description of the highest devotee, Bhagavadottamaka. Now, in our philosophical literature, you find at the highest experience level, the highest devotion and the highest wisdom, non-dualistic experience are the same. Sri Ramakrishna says pure jnanam and pure bhakti are the same in his works. In, in fact, Shankaracharya, in his commentary of the Gita, there is a portion where he says, purest devotion, where you have, you, have, you, have, you have unwavering devotion to God, will make you feel that that devotion is non-different from Jnanam means highest spiritual wisdom or non dualistic experience. Sacha Jnanam. The verse is this in the in my that in that uh, in that uh, uh, Gita chapter the Lord of what uh, Shankaracharya says is this Avibhijarini Bhakti or unwavering Bhakti. Nirmala, Achala, Shuddha, etc. He uses all these terms. That is Jnanam, that is the highest knowledge itself. So devotion at the highest, purest and most sublime level is the same thing as the highest non-dualistic mystical experience. That's the idea implied in this 45th verse. Now in the 46th verse, Hari comes down a few steps below and says, but this experience is not easy to reach. Before we have reached this experience, we should not try to practice spiritual socialism. It is very dangerous. <laughs> if you try to look upon everyone as a Brahman, you are, in, you are heading for a disaster. So, this is a very, very practical idea you find in the 46th verse. Here say, Ishwari tad adhineshu bali seshu dishut sucha prema maitri kripa ubeksha ye karodi sa madhyamaka. Madhyamaka actually means the middle level, not the highest, nor the lowest. He says, now what about those who are spiritual pilgrims, who have just started the spiritual journey, nor who have not reached the highest mystical experience? We may read, this is a great danger in spiritual life. We may read a great mystical work. Intellectually, we may grasp this idea. And immediately, we would like to believe that we have reached that level. But it is a great, this involves a great spiritual risk and danger. Because our intellect has grasped this great grand idea that the same divine principle is present everywhere, the same Brahman, Atman everywhere. So let us try to move with everyone. Then what happens, you know, our intellect has reached that level. Mind is far below. And we are all living at the mental level, not the intellectual level. All normal human beings are living at the mental level. When we read a book, when we grasp an idea, in a flash, we are dwelling at the intellectual level, idea level. But when we close the book and come down, we are at mental level again. And very often there is a wide gap between these two levels. So very often we forget this. And we try to impose upon ourselves the feeling. Nobody wants to consider himself to be a beginner. Everyone has got an inherent idea that I, am the, I belong to the highest type. Because if you, you don't want to uh, we consider it to be other than the best. So what really happens, we very often deceive ourselves, delude ourselves into the belief that what we have intellectually grasped, we have already experienced. This wrong idea is terribly dangerous. 
so for the spiritual seekers kavi sorry hari the second says gives a very practical suggestion well you should have complete devotion to god and then you should be friendly you should have an attitude of comradeship with those who are devotees of god and then what about those who do not know anything about god you should have sympathy compassion try to help them but what about those who are very powerful strong willed people but absolutely negative ideas they will them if you associate with them you are gone because they will convince you to their side because you have not reached the highest level we are not able to convert them but they are fully convinced of their uh, uh, materialistic or negative ideas so their strong conviction will have an overbearing effect upon us and they may even convert us so what what should what should we do keep a long distance so that's why ishara towards god you must have deep rooted devotion and towards his devotees we must have an attitude of friendliness comradeship and towards those who do not know much about god you should have compassion sympathy but those who hate god and those who are fully convinced of the most negative ideas keep a long distance if you try to convert try to con- go and convert them they will convert you to their side sometimes it happens you know some people will tell you well in the beginning you may say well stealing is bad and then there are some people well stealing is all right if it is es- most essential matter of survival so the idea changes and then stealing well pe- there is after all you know crimes are the creation of social labels so stealing is perfectly all right so slowly you find ideas change ideas get diluted so negative ideas will have an overbearing effect on our mind so what happens we must not hate them because hatred also creates problems hatred also creates bondage you know it also creates an inner bondage and extreme attachment also creates bondage so both we must avoid so upeksha means absolute indifference keep a long distance friend neither try to be very friendly with them or try to and don't go and quarrel with them then there is nothing else for you to do except quarreling with the bad people so what we must do keep a long distance so these are the four instructions given by hari for those to those who have not reached the highest level of devotional spiritual evolution those who are still following the path the track who are not reached at goal so ishare tad adhineshu balisheshu disutsucha prema maitri kripa upeksha ye karo this samadhyam uh, this four uh, recommendations you know prema means complete and wavering devotion to god maitri means friendliness you should be friendly with devotees of god because that will help you uh, in your spiritual life your convictions will be reinforced your experiences will be enriched if you converse with devotees fellow devotees of god so friendliness interaction with fellow devotees of god is very helpful in spiritual life and then those who do not know but they are good people those who do not know anything about spiritual values but they are interested to know they are good people you can help them compassion but there are people who are hardened atheists bohemians so if you try to convert them before you reach the highest goal it is this key so there is a story is told of uh you know buddha buddha was a was an enlightened spiritual personality who had reached the highest goal the same experience mentioned in the 45th verse earlier verse 
So one day Buddha was moving uh, through forests, and then some fellow travelers came and warned him. See, there is a great robber staying there. His name is Anguli Mala. He was a very violent person. His hobby was to kill people, rob them, and cut away their their finger their fingers and make a calendar. That was his hobby. Now many people warned him. See, don't go that way. It's very risky. And Buddha didn't care, and he continued walking. Now Anguli Mala came. Running after him, tried to chase Buddha, but could not uh, reach him because because Buddha was a man of realization. He had many divine powers, so Angulimala tried his best to catch up with Buddha, but he couldn't do that. And then, when Buddha just turned back, and Angulimala saw him, he underwent a complete transformation. He became a great saint. He became a great. Buddhist bhikshu later on. Now suppose a spiritual seeker who have not reached Buddhahood, the status of Buddha spiritual illumination. If he tries to convert Anguli Mala, he will get ten, a few more fingers. That's all. <laughs> so this is given. This is explained in one of the na Anguli Mala na Buddha Parichara in one of the. Sanskrit, uh, I mean, tikas, sub super commentaries, and commentator writes, "Don't behave like Buddha before you become Buddha." <laughs> so here, in the forty-fifth verse, a state of the highest spiritual illumination is described here. Before reaching that, if you feel that you are just spiritual seekers, then you must follow the instructions, the four instructions given in the forty-sixth verse. So, Ishwari tadha dhineshu, Bali seshu, Dishutsuja, Prema, Maitri, Kripa, Upeksha. Ye karodi samadhi maha. So, unwavering devotion to God, as I already explained, and a feeling of comradeship towards His God's towards God's devotees, compassion or sympathy towards those who do not know about God but would like to know about spiritual values. And complete indifference, a long distance from hardened atheists and hardened criminals. That these are the four instructions given to spiritual seekers in the forty-sixth verse. If I got anything to be clarified, you can ask during interaction session. <coughs> Now, in the forty-seventh verse, the great sage Hari. Comes down to the level of the lowest devotee. Prakrta means so means the one who has just started his spiritual journey. Archaya meva hariye puja ya sadhiye khade na tad bhakte shu cha nyesu sab bhakta pragudas mudha. This is the forty-seventh verse. Here Hari says there are some devotees who belong to the lowest type. But they also have some interest in spiritual values. But they believe that if they go to a place of worship, do some rituals, that is the beginning and that's the end of spiritual life. They they have no contact. They 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 don't look upon other fellow human beings as even human beings. They believe that the spiritual practice begins with formal worship. You can say archa. See, archa or archana means formal worship. It also means mechanical rituals. If you pay fixed amount to the church or a temple or religious organization, or if you subscribe to a magazine, or if you go to a place of worship just once a month and do some formal mechanical ritual. And then you need not worry. God will be happy. You should not disturb me for the next twenty-nine days. So I shall come again next day. Now, this kind of mechanical, formalistic worship, it is all right, but it is only the most primitive level of spiritual evolution. That's that's the implication of this verse. 
So the meaning is this. You shall read Archayam Eva Sadhya Hareyi Poojam Yaha Ikhati Tadbhakteshu Anneshu Na Sabhakta Pragrata. This is the prose order. You know, Bhagavata is a very complicated and a bit complex work from literary point of view, grammatical point of view. So if you need, I can give the prose order and explanations, but that would take a long time. That's why I was avoiding that. Anyhow, the 47th verse says this much. There are people who belong to the lowest, or the most primitive level of spiritual or devotional evolution. They will be satisfied with pure mechanical rituals and formalistic worship. And not only that, they hate all others. <laughs> they, 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 their devotion is confined to their own religion, their own particular denomination, their own particular temple, or their own particular place of worship. Beyond that, outside that, there is nothing. But God gives them also a small place in His empire. Because they are better than other human beings who are not very different from animals. After all, they feel that this kind of formalistic mechanical worship makes some sense. But they do not realize that it is the most primitive step in spiritual evolution. So, uh, Hari says, they natad bhakteshu channeshu. They do not recognize other devotees, the same God whom they worship. But they believe that their God is happy through this formalistic worship. Such people belong to the lowest primitive level. And they should slowly evolve further and further. This will explain in the next class tomorrow. No half an hour will have interaction. We can ask any question what we have already discussed or what I have not discussed. That's for you. We I try to clarify with my own capacity. Thank you. <coughs> oh yes. Who you raised first first okay, then after that. Um Swami, the answer to the first question yes. was the whatever you have done through body speech that and and then you said that a person who who really acts in that way is unable to do anything evil. Uh, yes. Could you talk more about that? Oh yes. You know, a person who sincerely surrendered his will to God will always remember God whenever he does any work. Mm -hmm. So that thought will be always associated with whatever action he does. I can give an example, a weird example from the life of Grish and Dragos. He was a bohemian, you know. He was a bohemian, a dramatist actor. And he was a drunkard. Sri Ramakrishna gave him many options. But ultimately, you know that I need not go into details. Then Sri Ramakrishna took the power of attorney from him. Maybe this man didn't understand what it actually implied. Sri Ramakrishna did understand. But what happened, later on it became physically and psychologically impossible for him to do anything bad. In his life, it's a, he tried to drink. Suddenly he found in the glass the picture of Sri Ramakrishna. Picture means the mental image, you know, because he suddenly remembered, I have given word, promise to that old priest, so I should not do anything that will hurt him. He had sincere devotion to Sri Ramakrishna, though he did not really understand his spiritual implication. Mm. But that act, because he was a sincere man, had a profound effect on his later life. He became physically and psychologically impossible for him to do anything bad and he became a saint. But that's in fact that is the real principle behind the concept of confession in Catholic religion. So Augustine defines confession in Confessions in City of God he find. So according to the original idea of confession, if you really confess to God then from Monday onwards you can't behave what you like. It is not uh, renewal of license actually. Actually real confession implies a complete real inner transformation according to Augustine. Otherwise that confession becomes a me mechanical ritual. So this idea 
is uh, is hindered at many other concepts like sarana gadi mean total surrender i already explained this on many occasions a person who really surrenders to god cannot do anything evil because he will not forget that he has surrendered so that memory will act as an obstacle whenever he tries to do anything evil that's how mind works you know. i think it's clear thank you, thank you. any other you use yes, so in that same verse where uh, uh, the sage kavi uh, describes kind you know so everything that is done to body mind speech do it as an offering to the lord is the solution he gets but our buddhi is most of the time in some it's in a manda state for some yes. reason <coughs> how to first of all remember to do that because uh, we remember a little bit come we listen and then we go off to our works and offices and then we forget some type of covering comes and you forget and you go on and then you come to a sunday lecture and then we oh we, we remember it is great we have scripture class and sunday lectures to, to refresh us how to remember it always while you are doing it no if we intensify this uh, i mean this ideal of surrender to make uh, to strengthen the memory so that it registers very strongly with the great intensity in the mind then we will not forget see in grishendra ghosh there are two factors one was it was sridamrishna to him he surrendered second factor was this man in spite of all his uh, undesirable characteristics he had one great quality he was a man of strong integrity when sridamrishna asked him could you take god's name once in he said no i can't do i don't know when i'm going to get up <laughs> now any ordinary man of lesser integrity would all right tomorrow on i will do and it had no effect on him <laughs> so generally these things do not have any effect on the seeker because the seeker himself is not very serious but in grishendra ghosh's case you know he he had many other vices but he was a man of strong integrity the very fact that he said i can't take god's name the morning and evening because i don't know when i'm going to sleep i don't know when i'm going to get up because he was he mostly he will be intoxicated so how can such a man give word but he didn't pretend to be a tea totaler he said that is his condition so that integrity that sincerity that worked a miracle in his life so in fact the strength the the force with which this surrender registers in our mind is in direct proportion to our own sense of integrity and honesty one story perhaps you know, i think i told some time back there was an evangelist a catholic evangelist in india who who worked in central provinces before independence to 1947 he was the one who said a poor gandhi he he is such a good man but he will go to hell he that was the kind of religion he practiced but he was a good man a very sincere honest man in his own convictions so what happened to him i read his life now what happened to him he fell sick he had some serious malaria and all that and he thought of going back to england england or european countries he was european uh, but then what happened one day and you know that for many days he prayed but didn't work so he had even booked his ticket from bombay to southampton then one whole night he tried then he said well god i prayed you prayed to you so many times and for lo- so long now i won't even pray to you i close my bargain here mm-hmm. from that moment onwards he started recovering <laughs> that is the story goes and he continued working in india for another 10 12 15 years mm-hmm. so a sincere seeker even in spite of his narrow minded views if he is sincere seeker the sincerity will take him to god sri ramakrishna's vyakulata that term sri ramakrishna uses this mean integrity honesty sincerity all put together is called so girishendra ghosh was a man of tremendous integrity sri ramakrishna caught hold of that and transformed him that's the idea there I have this question, Maharaj. We talked about uh, Anusrata Prabha. Anusrata Subha. Yes, yes. So the tendency is uh, 
we have mm. in the cycle. You know, we have karma, theory of karma. We have to mm. uh, reach that point. But uh, in the world, we confront so many things, and uh, we are compelled, or at least we we make some uh, <coughs> let's say choices or react, mm. and then later on we regret because we know this is not right. <coughs> The person with whom I talk to, yes, he is, he is also the same karma I am trying to do. Maybe I have done a little better. But then this conflict will always be there when you meet in the world. So how do we get out of that? Well, no. Anusuddha Subhava, as I said, no, accumulated inherent drives and tendencies. Yes. But if we make an offering of all these to God in all sincerity, then that thought will accompany all our actions. Whether we remember that we can never forget it. As I said, the integrity, the intensity with which we do this act of surrendering, making an offering to God. That will always remember. That will be always as a guiding light behind and along with every action that we do. The, that's why we have to we should try to intensify that act of surrender for a person like Giri Shandra Ghosh it's just a single event was enough not, maybe not just because of his integrity alone but because he, he was uh, giving this power of attorney to Sri Ramakrishna himself that could be one, one reason but Sri Ramakrishna also could make use of that part of his character and with that, he gave him a new life. So, if a person is really uh, sincere and honest to the core, then he can have a change in his life. And one question you may ask, what about our inherent accumulated tendencies? Yes, but even then, if you do that, even your mechanical, involuntary actions, or which you have no control, which are manifestations of your accumulated tendencies and impressions in previous life, even these actions will be overshadowed by the memory. Well, I have made an offering of everything to God. That's the idea behind. But it, again, it is directly in relation to the intensity with which we have surrendered. A Girishandra goes when he did, he did completely. You know, how do we understand it? Because he said, he said he is a drunkard, he can't remember God's name, so that won't work for him. Now, only a man of the highest sincerity and integrity could talk like that. Normal man will say, all right, tomorrow onwards I shall not, he will say not, and he will, not, he will not, it will have no effect on him. Very often these things do not have effect on our life because we don't take very seriously. At least we don't take as seriously as Girisandra Ghosh took it. Because he took seriously, he said he will not be able to practice it. Practice teetotalitarian, whatever what we call it. He cannot become a Puritan, he said. Sri Ramakrishna asked him not to drink. Sri Ramakrishna asked him to take the name of God. He knew very well that he won't be able to do that. So he openly said it's not possible for him because of his integrity. So it's a Continuous practice. Ah, yes. Continuous practice can intensify and enrich and reinforce this integrity. Of course. That's true. It's unfortunate, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. These events and all these things bring a lot of animosity. Eh? Bring a lot of animosity and differences in conversation and this and that. And we realize that after the fact. But if you, every day if it rise, then we can reduce the... Uh, the, the 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 occasion we can reduce we can go on reducing every day if you realize then we can reduce it that's it that's the idea behind Girishandra's character is a complex character right now because he was he belonged to a particular ca particular category so many people like Dostoevsky's life if you see Dostoevsky people like them you know practically in their life there is nothing spiritual. But there was something great about them. Otherwise, how could you write uh, work like Brothers of Karamazoo, Grand Inquisitor, and all that? A glimpse into the ultimate intuitive spiritual experience you get in their works. Because 
such people suddenly start a new chapter in their life and become saints. They have their equipments with them, but it is concealed. If a great spiritual personality is like Sri Ramakrishna, happen to help them, it becomes easier. <laughs> but even otherwise, through constant practice, we can reinforce our own conviction and enrich and bring in more and more integrity. That's it. Is it not so? And this sravanam, sravanam means constant hearing. Manana means introspection, will help us. Let's say sravana means constant hearing, manana means introspection. These two together can reinforce our integrity. So in addition to meditation, contemplation, ah, yes, yes. these ideas, then yes. uh, offering to God, and all these things are very important. I see, your, our mind has come within that realm of that, otherwise you won't be worried about it. We feel the need for spiritual evolution because we have already entered the field. We have already started the spiritual pilgrimage. Otherwise, we won't feel the need for spiritual enlightenment. See? So that means we are already on the, on the track. So if we continue Const continue hearing, constant hearing and introspection, we can go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. okay, okay. Well, yeah, as you're speaking of the, the, this intensity of determination that we must have, is that what, what slowly bridges the gap between um, really living at the mental level to this, as you say, this you can understand intellectually these sublime ideas, but our life is way behind. We live more at the mental level. And it's this intensity of determination that bridges that gap until yes, yes. it reflects in this higher into the, the, the buddhi. Yes. Is, is, is that... The, the, what is called the constant hearing and introspection, sravana, manana. These, are, these uh, constitute a refer to increase integrity and, re and, uh, and increase intensity. That will certainly bridge the gap between uh, intellect and mind. Because when we, when we really start living according to our convictions, then the gap is filled, bridged. When the, then the gap is bridged. So as we start practicing more and more, then we find the gap gets narrowed more and more. So, so in the, something related to that. Uh, so in the three classifications of devotees, you see a, uh, a psychological as well as an ego transformation happening as, as you grow from the lowest to the Bhagavatam. Mm. In the highest stage... Here, you have to remember one minute. Here in this verse, 1 point 45, 46, 47, uh, here the description is in a descending order. Yes, yes. That you have to keep it yeah, yeah, for you. Yeah, okay. So from, from, okay. From, from, from right. to yes. Yes. Correct. When you go, Correct. Uh, you could see the mental and psychological transformation in a person as you go through that. And all of us have gone through that uh, transformation. Uh, in the highest stage, uh, it seems to me that it's more of an experience, uh, an intuitive understanding of reality, which is hinted rather than, uh, you know, which is actually beyond. Uh, what a devotee can grasp, you know, with this pattern these. Whereas the other thing seems to be like, uh, hey, a devotee is actually trying to practice some things and he's uh, making an evolution. So, uh, I want you to comment on um, on the experience aspects on these three uh, devotees and how that can actually help us move from one stage to the other. Well, that's why I said there are two levels of evolution. Evolution at the level of the ultimate reality. A revolution at the understanding of goal. No, this is the goal doesn't evolve, our understanding evolves. So, accordingly, the devotee also evolves and goes through three levels of evolution. So, uh, one could say the 47th verse, the last one, the primitive, what is explained in this 47th verse, explains a very incomplete understanding of the absolute reality. And the 46th verse explains less incomplete, maybe more complete uh, understanding. And the 45th verse 
explains a complete and perfect understanding of absolute reality the reality is the same our level of understanding evolves and the rea- the reality doesn't evolve our understanding evolves and according to the evolution of our own understanding our own spiritual evolution takes place the one point to remember is 47th verse describes the characteristics of a devotee of the most primitive type and 46th verse describes those of a of a, of a devotee belonging to the middle level and 45th verse the the first verse that i explained uh, describes the characteristics of the highest devotee so the description is in a descending or descending order from the highest to the lowest that is the uh, approach uh, i mean adapted here and also in the gita 12th chapter Uh, the reason i wanted to ask you this is that like in the madhava sampradaya or some of the other sampradaya which are you know you pretty much stay at, at that level and then like you go uh, you know at the highest level which is actually hinted there um, what i find is a very big disparity in the, in, in not reconciling True. other religions yes yes but at the same time being able to reach the highest uh, so i don't understand so that is the reason for my question that like that it seems that like as if you are able to you know transcend some of these uh, ethical physical boundaries in an apparent leap towards a super conscious or uh, super sensuous reality see philosophical evolution is different from spiritual evolution you sometimes you find even among those who do not have a philosophy comparable to this there are there are big mystics who have reached a very high level but even they in their words we get the idea they have reached a very higher level of experience though their philosophy doesn't support it see most of the great mystics of middle ages in their writings you can find glimpses of the highest what we normally call bhakti experience or advaitic experience I mean non dualistic experience but their religious or theological scriptures do not support that view because such a system of philosophy did not evolve in the theological tradition mm-hmm. but at the experience level see if you read eckhart for example in eckhart you find he says the knower the known and knowledge merge into one now he was though he had to face some opposition still he belonged to the theological the accepted theological mystical tradition but Uh, in the uh, in the received theological tradition his views may not get much support though he had reached that experience level that you find so that's point here to remember see <coughs> philosophy ca- is a very inadequate tool uh, to express higher spiritual mystical experiences see philosophy belongs to the dvaita level you have to remember philosophy belongs to the dualistic level the level of differences and plurality philosophy can never be non dualistic even shankaracharya says non non dualism is a matter of experience only not of philosophy there is no such thing as non dualistic philosophy he himself says but then what happens non dualistic philosophical superstructure builds up a philosophical foundation in support of advaita but advaita in reality is a matter of experience see advaita in reality is a matter of experience shrutya yuktya swanubhutya books scriptures the logical analysis then one son intuitive experience that's why at the experience level there is a prefer reconciliation between philosophy and intuitive experience that's fine so mystic mystical experience can never be adequately expressed in philosophical vocabulary <coughs> it's a very inadequate tool philosophy after all belongs to language only language can never be an effective tool to exp- exp- express experience did uh, any of these philosophers you know who have tried with their ideas pick the supreme there there be many all these <coughs> there be many many you can find in all you see <coughs> practically in all religious traditions there have been great 
uh, men and women who are reached the highest mystical experience i say you have to remember this please remember the what i said earlier in certain religious traditions the theological superstructure may not support this higher mystical experiences but in vedanta it fully supports and expounds it that's the idea behind so there are uh, there are many even even in religious traditions which are not so well known what we normally call primitive religious traditions there have been great men we do not know because of, because mystical experience is a matter of inner human qualities like integrity sincerity inner growth it is not the result of philosophical structure superstructure what i said was in many religious traditions though they may not there may not be any uh, theological or logical support for mystical experience they are having mystics who have gone beyond theology and philosophy so there is one question that the in all of this you know where does the grace fit into all of this a uh, grace grace is a, 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 is actually it is a subject uh, dealt with in devotional literature grace um there are there are two concepts you know parallel concepts not parallel really grace and human effort so uh, at the higher mystical level uh, there is a reconciliation between grace and human effort when we uh, when we stand outside when we have not started a spiritual journey we feel there is a uh, gap there is a, a difference between grace on the one hand and self effort on the other but when we really enter spiritual life you find they get reconciled i can explain this in the light of another uh, parable in sri ramakrishna's gospel you find see sri ramakrishna refers to i mean he in his gospel you find he refers to this subject suppose you want to cross the river and there's a boat in uh, tied to the anchor if you really want to cross the river you have to untie the anchor you have to enter the boat and you have to reach midstream you have to, maybe you may have to row a little and then you can make use of the wind that is blowing now uh, if you just sit outside if you sit on the banks of the river and say i want to cross the river you won't be able to do that so you have to shake off your laziness and lethargy you have to enter the boat and you have to do some work to take the boat to the midstream and then only you will be able to make proper use of uh, this uh, breeze the wind you know but another question arises who gave you this ability to untie the anchor the same god who his grace is blowing in the form of wind made you enabled you to untie the anchor and take the boat mystery so, but you can you distinguish these two if you just sit on the bank of the river i want to cross the river then the wind will not help you will not, will not be able will not be helpful to you so first you have to do some self effort and then you will be able to make use of the grace without self effort we will not be able to make proper use of grace but once you start making use of grace you understand the self effort also was possible because of grace so self effort merges in grace before that we may think self effort is one thing grace another but if you look back who gave me the power the ability to untie the anchor enter the boat and do the work necessary to take the boat till the middle of this river well, the same god who sent this wind of grace enabled me to shake off my lethargy so instead of sitting on the bank saying i want to cross the river i untied the anchor and entered the boat and did necessary work so human effort is part of grace but this is realized only at the practical level 
once you enter spiritual journey, not before. So be, be, not only that, if you don't make your own effort, you won't be able to recognize grace as grace. Suppose Sri Ramakrishna or Christ or Buddha or anybody appears before you all of a sudden, you won't realize you think he's another person who has come to see to enter, uh, attend the retreat. But if you pray with great intensity and integrity, and then if you get an experience, then you will realize, you will, you will be able to appreciate, you will be able to recognize the act of grace. If God suddenly comes to us, we won't recognize Him. We won't do that. So even to be able to recognize God's grace, self-effort is necessary. So self-effort uh, gives us the equipment the ability to appreciate, understand and make use of God's grace. I think this explained, as I said earlier, you know, in the, in the complete works of uh, uh, Saint Avila, Saint Teresa of Avila, you find the story mentioned, you know. She uses the analogy of a farmer who is trying to irrigate the land. There is a lot, uh, a lot of weeds and grass and undesirable growth. So, the farmer first clears the ground, removes the weeds, and there is a river nearby. Uh, there is a well, there is a water mill. There are many options for him to bring water to the field. But suppose suddenly it starts raining, it's God's grace. But even to be benefited by rains, you need to do some work. You have to remove the weed. Yes. You have to remove the grass. Otherwise, if it starts raining, the grass also will grow. So, to be able to fully understand the real worth of grace, to become grace-worthy, self-effort is necessary. But self-effort also, on a larger plane, is a part of grace. But that fact is recognized at the experience level. That's the idea we have. I think we have already reached the end of time. So, <coughs> we continue this discussion at 3.30 this afternoon. <coughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Dhat Sat Shri Ramushpan Pamastu